Christian apologist Frank Turek sure likes talking about Dr. Bart Ehrman. And who admits this? Bart Ehrman himself. You know, he wrote the book Misquoting Jesus. But for something he practices so much, he's not very good at it. Why is, I mean, the book maybe should be called Misquoting Ehrman. Are you saying he invented the phrase Misquoting Ehrman or that he's somebody who he seems to have coined it to slam you? But not, he's not using it of himself. No, he's definitely not that self-aware. <laughs> okay, got it. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. We're here today to break down the top six times when apologist Frank Turek misquoted or misrepresented Dr. Bart Ehrman with Dr. Bart Ehrman, who has a big weekend coming up with an amazing learning opportunity for all of us. The course is called The Scribal Corruption of Scripture. It's a four-lecture course with a large Q&A afterwards about how copyists of the New Testament often changed the text they were copying, a lot of times by accident, but sometimes on purpose. It's related to a, a book I wrote years ago called Misquoting Jesus, but it's going to be covering a lot of information not in that book and a lot of information people generally have, haven't heard before. We'll talk more about that later, which you should stay tuned for. But first, let's get to Frank. I don't know if you've come across Frank Turek on your own. People have told me about him. <laughs> okay. All right. I, so I haven't, I, I'm eager to hear him because I've never heard him. So here we go. He's a student of Norman Geisler. When I got out of the Navy, I ran into Dr. Norman Geisler, who at the time was the Michael Jordan of apologetics. Do you remember Norman Geisler? Norman Geisler was influential in my life. He, he uh, I don't know if he knows this, but he came to Moody Bible Institute when I was a junior and gave a lecture, and in his lecture he talked about how Christian, fundamentalist Christian, he didn't call them fundamentalists, but how Christians have to become, it helps to be educated in non-Christian academics, and he was a philosopher. And that's what made me convinced I needed to go to Princeton Theological Seminary to get credentialed. And so I owe, owe it all to Norman Geisler, who now really does not like me. <laughs> oh boy, okay. I made you. You made me first. Let's kick it off with number six. The First Corinthians 15 Creed. In First Corinthians 15, and this creed, even atheistic scholars like Bart Ehrman, a skeptic from UNC Chapel Hill, admits this is very early. He puts this at, all the way back to the resurrection itself, months, maybe weeks, that this creed came out of early Christianity, the early believers. So I actually had Bart on my mm -hmm. channel last mm -hmm. week to talk about Gary Habermas saying that very thing. And Bart disagrees. Bart says that's not what he Well, believes. maybe he's changing his tune because he did believe that at one point. It's an early creed. No, I've never said that. <laughs> and you know, it probably wouldn't be hard for Frank to look it up <laughs> to see what I've actually said. I do not think that this is a creed that goes back to weeks after Jesus' death. What's he thinking? I guess he's thinking that I, I think that the belief in Jesus' resurrection goes back to after his death. So I'll tell you one problem that people like Frank have. I know nothing about his education. You just said that he, you know, he studied with Norman Geisler. And so I don't know whether he's actually trained in biblical studies. But one very, very big problem that people have who are not trained in biblical studies is they don't know what technical terms mean that scholars use. And so this creed in 1 Corinthians 15 has long been called, for many decades now, has been called a pre-Pauline creed. And when scholars say that, they mean that this creed was around before Paul quoted it in 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul wrote 1 Corinthians sometime in the 50s, late 50s. So Paul wrote it then, and sometime before then, he had acquired the creed. Now, the thing is that he says that this is what he taught the Corinthians when he first converted them. So that'd be somewhat earlier. It'd be earlier in the 50s. So sometime earlier than he converted the Corinthians, he acquired this creed. But in other words, it might be 20, 25 years after Jesus' death. But that's not like a few weeks afterward. And so Frank just, when he says, I believe that, I'd like to see him show it. You know, he's an apologist, so he believes in proving things. So I'd like him to prove that I've said that. Number five. People like Bart Ehrman at UNC Chapel Hill and others, they used to adopt an alternative theory to the resurrection. There was uh, hallucinations or something like that, right? They don't, they don't pick a, an alternative theory anymore because they know everyone they pick is flawed. And so what do they say now? They go, we don't know what happened. They don't have an explanation. Uh, yeah, that's not true. So why would he say that about me? I wrote a book called How Jesus Became God. And what I said is that some of the followers of Jesus believed they saw him alive afterwards. And I absolutely think that, and I've thought that for as long as I know, 
that some of the disciples said they saw him, believed they saw him. And in my book, I call those visions. But I say that there are two kinds of visions. The word vision just comes from the Latin word video, which means to see. And so, you know, when I look out over the mountains, I can say, wow, that's a, this vision is fantastic. <laughs> and I don't mean I'm like hallucinating. I mean, I'm seeing something that's there. Sometimes you see something that's there and sometimes you see something that's not there. Psychologists who talk about this phenomenon call those non-veridical visions. And so non-veridical means that you're seeing something that isn't actually ob objectively there. And that happens a lot. One in eight people among us, one of eight people listening to this, will see a deceased loved one after their death. And it's not an unusual thing at all. It happens all the time. And not just loved ones, but, you know, I mean, thousands of people see Mary Mag... I uh, see, see... I'm not Mary Magdalene. Although they may wish, huh. but they, they actually see Mary, the mother of Jesus. Sometimes hundreds of people at one time will see Mary, the mother of Jesus. I don't think Frank thinks they really saw her. But, uh, you know, they claim to have seen her. And the disciples of Jesus based their belief in Jesus' resurrection on what they thought they'd see. They thought they saw Jesus alive afterwards. There are other explanations people have. And so we don't know the details of that, but I think that's what happened. Right. So you're not afraid of naturalistic theories? I'm not afraid of natural. Well, no. What other kind? I mean, <laughs> so, what, so look, one out of eight of us will uh, see a deceased loved one, okay? So uh, what's that percentage? You should know, do the math, whatever it is. 14-ish <laughs> percent. 14% uh, 14, yeah. 14 How many of us will rise from the dead after three days? Zero percent. So if you're just doing, you know, what is more likely to have happened, that somebody was raised from the dead or that somebody thought they saw somebody who was alive afterwards, what, just why would I be afraid of a, the more probable solution? <laughs> I'm not afraid of probability. <laughs> Number four, step forward. Do we have an accurate copy of the original New Testament documents? There's a lot of people out there who say no. Bart Ehrman is one of them. He wrote a book called Misquoting Jesus, where he says we can't trust the manuscripts. He's all wrong, but that's what he says. We can recreate the original to more than 99% accuracy. So we know what the original said. Even the famous skeptic Bart Ehrman agrees we know what the original said. All right. So apparently you say both things. So I assume that Frank doesn't believe there are any contradictions in the New Testament. And it may be because he doesn't believe that there's such a thing as a contradiction. <laughs> because what he just well, said is a contradiction. <laughs> either. <laughs> okay, so two things. One is when Frank says we do have the original New Testament, I'd like him to show it to me and to everybody else. I don't know if he knows Greek or not. I don't know if he studied the field of textual criticism, which is what my PhD was in. And that was what my first uh, 20 years of scholarship were involved with analyzing Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And so I don't know if he's ever like compared two manuscripts to one another. That's called collating. It's kind of one of the preliminary steps you take where you take two manuscripts and you compare them to each other to see where they differ which sentences are different, what verses, what words are different, you know, and you go letter by letter through a manuscript to do this. It's basic training in textual criticism. And I don't know if he's ever done it, but I've done a lot of it. And I will tell you that of the somewhere like 5,700 manuscripts of the New Testament we have in Greek, that includes little fragments and entire whole manuscripts. Among them, no two of them is exactly alike, except for like some of the tiny fragments. If you have like one line, it might be like a line in the major, a whole manuscript, you know, but but yeah, so so that's why we have scholars, including those who are conservative evangelicals, who work very diligently in trying to figure out what the original words said, because even the, these evangelical scholars know we don't have the original. And of course, I've never said we had the original. The other thing I'll say is when Frank says that we know 99%, where's he getting that number from? Why 99? Why not like 98.4 or 99.3? <laughs> He's just making up a number. And so how do you go about establishing how much we have? The only way you know that one copy is 99% like another copy is when you compare the two and you see how many differences there are. And so say out of every 100 words, there's one word that's different. That would be a 99% agreement. So if you had the original, you could compare a manuscript to it and see how often it differs from the original. You could say, well, it's 99% the same. But the point is we don't have the original. So how do you know what the 99% is? What, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. What's he talking about? I have no idea what he's talking about. I've studied this area for 50 years of my life. I don't know what he's talking about when he says we have 99%. <laughs> Maybe he can tell us what he's talking about. <laughs> Number three. But in 2005, he wrote a book called Misquoting Jesus, a popular book uh, in which he tries to insinuate that we can't trust what the New Testament documents have said. Yet the very same year 
2005, he wrote an academic work. He updated an academic work with his mentor, Dr. Bruce Metzger from Princeton University. In fact, Metzger was the top manuscript scholar of the last century. And in that book, he agrees with Metzger that the New Testament documents are copied accurately. Bruce Metzger did not think that the New Testament copies were copied accurately. A line that people like Frank get upset with me saying is a line that Metzger used to say all the time. And I got it from him. They didn't get upset with him because he was a committed Christian and a, a very devout Christian. And, you know, and I, I adored him and I, you know, owe a lot of my scholarship to him. But so Metzger used to say regularly that there are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. That's an exact quote. He used to say it all the time. So I don't know what Frank means when he says that Bruce Metzger thought that the scribes copied their New Testaments accurately. Now, why is he coming to two different conclusions the same year, same evidence? The only thing I can speculate is when you say to the academic community something wrong, they'll correct you on it. But when you say something wrong to the lay community, they don't know any better in most cases. You can sell a lot of books when you say the New Testament documents aren't copied reliably. That gets you a review in the New York Times, that gets you on the Colbert Show, the Jon Stewart Show. You sell a lot of books. Look, going on the Colbert Show is not really a treat. <laughs> Colbert is the fastest thinking human being on the planet. And I'm just telling you, you don't have a prayer. <laughs> so, no, look, I mean, it's, com it's completely bogus. When Frank writes a book, I assume he writes books. I haven't he, read it. He has. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. This is his best one. Okay. Well, I assume he writes it for people to read. I mean, he wants people to read it. And I write books because I want people to read them. And so it's a little bit disingenuous for him to accuse me of writing books so that people will read them when that's precisely what he does. Now, here's what he says. This is in the appendix of the paperback version. So this comes out a year or two later from the original Misquoting Jesus. He's interviewed, and in the interview, here's what he says. Check this out. This is a quote from the book, page 252. He says, Bruce Metzger is one of the great scholars of modern times. He is a firmly committed Christian, and I am not. We are in complete agreement on, the number of, on a number of very important historical and textual questions. What are they in agreement on? If he and I were put into a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original text of the New Testament probably looked like, there would be very few points of disagreement. The position I argue for in misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's position that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Well, why would you write misquoting Jesus then? Not you, but Bart Ehrman, right? In my course that I'm going to be doing on November 11th, I'm going to be dealing directly with this issue because this is an argument that people like to use. And what they're arguing, I think Dan Wallace uses the phrase, the cardinal doctrines. The cardinal doctrines of Christianity are not affected by these variants. And I've got two, two replies to that, three replies to that. I don't know how many replies I've got to that. We'll find out. <laughs> oh, let's see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, first thing is that textual variants certainly affect major doctrines of Christianity. Is Jesus God himself or the Son of God? Many fundamentalists, I don't know what Frank's position is on this, but fundamentalists these days are saying that Jesus himself is Yahweh. And if you go that route, it's based on a textual variant in John, the Gospel of John. Did Jesus' death bring an atonement for sins? Depends on some textual variants in Luke. Did Jesus suffer during his passion? Did he suffer? Depends on some textual variants. Is the Trinity explicitly stated in the Bible? Depends on a textual variant. You can just kind of go down the line. And so Metzger would definitely not say, he absolutely would not say that textual variants are unrelated to important Christian doctrines. What he would say is that textual variants won't change the doctrines. And what he means by that is something that people like Frank probably aren't paying close attention to. What he means by that is that doctrines, the, what Frank's calling the essential Christian doctrines, whatever they are, it, let me say this about it. If he includes as one of the essential Christian doctrines, the doctrine of inerrancy, then he's wrong. Metzger would agree that textual variants, in fact, that Metzger knows, Metzger used to say all the time, that one of the most common changes scribes made in the text was to harmonize the Gospels. In other words, when Matthew says one thing that contradicts what Mark says, a scribe will change one or the other of them so that there's no longer a tension, no longer a discrepancy. 
That's a standard and line, and Metzger didn't believe in inerrancy, and so he would absolutely agree with that. But the reason for saying that they don't affect essential doctrines, if you actually understand the reasoning behind it, I agree with it. These things do not affect essential doctrines because doctrines are never based on a single verse. So that if I can show that in Luke's gospel, which I can show, I think, I'm in my course, I'm going to be trying to show this, that in Luke's gospel, Luke does not have a doctrine of atonement. Luke does not think that Jesus' death is what brings salvation. That, in other words, that Jesus died for the sins of others. Right. Whoa, that's big. Yeah. yeah. But wouldn't it affect the doctrine of atonement? No, because people say, yeah, well, Mark says it. <laughs> Paul says it. <laughs> and even if Luke disagrees with Mark and Paul, at least they say it. And so you build your doctrine on other things. The final thing I'll say, sorry I'm taking so long on this no. one, but but it's an Please. important point. The final thing I'll say about it is that it's a little bit crazy, in my view, to say that that if it doesn't affect a doctrine, it's not a, not important. If it doesn't affect one of the essential Christian doctrines, it doesn't matter anymore. That's crazy. What if I could show, for example, what if I could prove that Jesus actually was crucified, that Jesus was not crucified by Pontius Pilate, but that he's crucified by King Herod in Galilee outside of Nazareth. Suppose wow. I could prove that. I can't prove it, but <laughs> suppose I could prove it. Would that matter? Well, I think for most people, they'd say, yeah, that's pretty important. Would it affect any doctrine? No. What doctrine would it affect? It wouldn't affect any doctrine. You could still have the death of Jesus for the sins of the world. You could still have the resurrection of the dead. You could still have Jesus as the Son of God. You still have the Trinity. It wouldn't right. affect any of those doctrines. What if tomorrow, this is the example I usually use, what if tomorrow, suppose the Gospel of Mark the book of First Peter and, and say, the, the book of Acts, say, all disappear from every Bible on the planet and they no longer exist, okay? So they're like, oh my God, they've all disappeared. Would okay. that be significant? <laughs> yes. Would it affect any principal Christian doctrine? No. So why go on about, uh, so anyway, most of these kinds of lines that Frank's throwing out are meant to comfort people that mm. we actually know God's word. And I get that, but he's saying things that just aren't right. Why is, I mean, the book maybe should be called Misquoting Ehrman because he doesn't even agree with himself. So it seems that even Ehrman, when, when push comes to shove, admits that we do have an accurate copy of the New Testament documents. I think Frank and I ought to have a debate sometime. He debated Christopher Hitchens at one point. How did he do? Not very well in my view. But, uh, <laughs> Christopher Hitchens was one smart fellow. Let me tell you. To be fair, he also debated me last year. So he, he's got a very broad scale. <laughs> Whoa, okay. I, how did you do? I think we did pretty well. It was, a lot of it was about Star Wars. and so. <laughs> so uh, well, you know, he said we there. So I, my, my experience in all these, deba every debate I've ever had, my experience is that the other guy and I, it's always a guy for some reason, the other guy and I both walk away saying, man, we really creamed him. <laughs> yeah, that's <right>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about how we both feel, I think, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Number two. One of the problems that I think people like Bart Ehrman have is they had the view that many Christians have, unfortunately, that if you find one inconsistency in the Bible anywhere, the whole thing tumbles like a house of cards. That is not the case. No, it's just the opposite of my position. I've said repeatedly over the years, time and time again, and so, I don't know, maybe he just doesn't listen to me, I, I don't know that contradictions of the Bible have nothing to do with the validity of the Christian faith. I mean, they have they have some bearing on whether you can believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. <laughs> right. If there are contradictions, <laughs> then, then you know, there's a mistake. <laughs> if there's contradictions, yep. there's a mistake. So if you're a fundamentalist and you believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, then one inconsistency would be a big problem. And for me, the first inconsistency I found that I finally was convinced, yeah, that, that is a contradiction. That did affect my fundamentalist belief. But as Frank surely knows, I remained a committed Christian for many years after that, active in church and teaching Sunday school and adult education and preaching long after I gave up the problem of the issue of inerrancy. And I was a pastor of the Princeton Baptist Church, and I preached every Sunday morning. Bruce Metzger listened to it because I preached on the radio, and Bruce Metzger listened to it. And at that point, I absolutely thought there were contradictions in the Bible. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't mean I wasn't a Christian. So no, the idea that it has to all tumble down, that's just a fundamentalist point of view that he's got. I don't know why he thinks I've got it, because I, yeah, I keep funny. thinking I never did have it. <laughs> I know. He puts it on you for some reason. I don't I don't know. Uh, do you have time for one more? There's just yeah, one last yeah. one. No, this is fun. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, great. Number one. 
Because a lot of kids, I'll tell you, go off to college with nothing but feel-good emotionalism. And when they run into a college professor who is bent on atheism, and he gives what seems like good arguments against Christianity, they're left defenseless, Hank. Professor Bart Ehrman. Yes. Uh, he has become world famous. Mm -hmm. he's, he's particularly proud of doing the very thing uh, that you're alluding to, and that is causing the faith of many of his students to waver. He says, and I'll quote him, he says, some students resist for a long time secure in their knowledge that God would not allow any falsehoods into a sacred book, but before long as students see more and more of the evidence, many of them find that their faith in the trustworthiness of Scripture begins to waver. His contention is, in the end, most, if not all, evangelical students walk away from the faith. Yeah, they do, and he's trying to make them do that. Yeah, that's just false. And if you want to know how false it is, all they have to do is ask any of my students. Ask them. I spend I multiple times throughout every semester to all my classes, I tell them that I'm not interested in changing your faith. I'm not interested in converting you or deconverting you. Your faith is, you know, your faith. And you, you need to figure out what you believe and why you believe it. But I'm not interested in you becoming an agnostic or an atheist or following my path. I don't even tell students what my personal beliefs are until the final day of class. So I, it's not like I start out, I do not make arguments that try to disprove Christianity. I think it sounds like both this interviewer and Frank mistake fundamentalism Christianity for Christianity. They don't realize that the majority of Christians in the world are not fundamentalists like them, believing in the inerrancy of the Bible. Students who take my classes often do come in from very conservative Christian households. So I teach in North Carolina, so it's in the South, and most of my students come from church families, and I absolutely welcome them, as they will tell you. I've had tens of thousands of students over the, God, I don't know how many students I've had over the years. And I think you can probably ask any one of them, if, did Professor Ehrman try to get you to be a non-Christian? <laughs> <laughs> and if they say yes, they just weren't paying attention because I'm here. Yeah. Like, I ask weird, I say. But we do talk about the Bible from a historical point of view. And when you do that, you have to acknowledge that Matthew and John are not saying the same thing that there are places where Matthew will say something, that Mark will talk about the same story, and they'll have differences that cannot be reconciled. And the same is if you throw Luke into the mix, and you just, it's historically the case. And many students are re reluctant to do that because they've listened to people like Frank, and they've heard that, well, you know, there can't be any mistakes. And so they come in thinking there can't be any mistakes. And boy, when they say that I go after the emotionalism, they're wrong there. Man, I just, I have my students look at Matthew's account of Jesus' birth, look at Luke's account of Jesus. I don't tell them what to expect. I tell them, make a list of everything that happens in Matthew. In the first two chapters of Matthew, make a list in Jesus' birth. What happens in the first two chapters of Luke? Make a list. Compare your lists and see if there's anything that would constitute a discrepancy. And if so, are there any that cannot be reconciled? I don't insist that they agree with me on it. I have them do it. And I don't even tell them in advance what to find. And they come back to the class and say, oh, my God, I had no idea. <laughs> See, yeah, of course not. <laughs> I didn't tell you this. You found it for yourself. So I think that kind of study is really important because I think it's important for people who are going to be Christian to be knowledgeable about their Christianity. And I think people who are agnostic or atheist or Muslim or Buddhist or whatever they are, it's important for them to be knowledgeable about what they think and what they believe and how they practice. I myself am not a believer, but I have zero interest in making other people non-believers. I do have an interest in getting people to think, and my sense is Frank doesn't have that mission. Many of us, we're not on a truth quest, we're on a happiness quest. And we're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. I don't know. I don't know him. I've never, but, you know, he wants them to accept his views. And he's out there to convert people to his views. And I'm not out there to convert people to my personal religious views. But, you know, he is. And so I can understand why he'd feel threatened. Perfect. Well, we're done with people misrepresenting you, at least for today. Let's shift gears to you properly representing your own scholarship in the Scribal Changes course. I'd like to because it's, of all the courses I've done, this is the one that's near and dear to me <laughs> because I got interested in this topic at Moody Bible Institute when I was 17 and I went off to graduate school to study this thing. I spent three years on a master's degree and four years on a PhD studying this kind of area and it's been the first 20 years of my career. And so this is stuff I'm really interested in. And many people will know kind of the basics, you know, that, well, we don't have the originals, we have copies, they've changed, and, you know, might know a couple of major changes. 
So I'm, in this course, I'm going into some detail that people wouldn't know, but at a level that everybody's going to be able to understand and see why it really matters. And the why it matters is not because I have some kind of subjective atheist agenda that I'm trying to make everybody an atheist. It matters whether you are a, a fundamentalist or just any kind of Christian or any kind of non-Christian or just a person who lives in the West <laughs> or lives in the world because the Bible is such an important book. It's important to know what we really know about it. And in this level, this is something that even many scholars don't know the kinds of things I'm going to be talking about in this course, New Testament scholars. But I'll be providing information many wouldn't have known, but I'll present it at a layperson's level. Now, I think a lot of people at a layperson level hear these and they think, well, scribal errors, you're just talking about spelling mistakes. But am I right in thinking that you are going to go into things where scribes made deliberate choices as opposed to a mistake? Yeah. And I think anybody who knows about this field, I mean, that's pretty obvious to everybody. I don't know anybody who disagrees that their scribes were sometimes intentionally changing the text. I mean, you know, as many people who are listening to this probably know, may know, the famous story of Jesus and the woman who was caught in adultery, where they want to stone her to death for committing adultery. And Jesus says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. This fantastic story in John chapter 7 and 8 was not originally in the Gospel of John. It wasn't in any of the Gospels. It was added later, as Bruce Metzger would say quite firmly. <laughs> and it was not added by a slip of the pen. <laughs> it right, wasn't yeah. a spelling mistake. It's not <laughs> a jot or a tittle. I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is not a jot or a tittle. This is an entire story that, of course, is like the most popular story in Hollywood when it comes to Jesus. And it was, it was not originally in the New Testament. So does that matter? Well, it might not matter for your doctrine of atonement, but it surely matters. <laughs> I think right. it matters. And so, you know, not all changes are of that magnitude, but there are others that are, you know, pretty close to that magnitude. And there are others that affect Christian doctrines, serious, seriously affect Christian doctrines. There are hundreds of thousands of differences in our manuscripts, and I won't be talking about hundreds of thousands of differences <laughs> in my four lectures, but I'm going to pick some that are really interesting and some of them that people would, wouldn't know about. And if they join us on November 11th, I think they'll even get to ask questions at the end. So that'd be awesome. That's going to be great. We're going to have an extended Q&A with people asking questions, and I'm really pumped for it. I think this is of fundamental importance, and it's only been within the last 20 years or so that non-scholars have realized that there's a problem here. And non-scholars have known it, and many, most scholars have never told it. Which is actually part of my personal journey. And one reason this channel exists, I went to Bible school, served in ministry for decades, and never heard a peep about all the evidence we have about how the Christian Bible came to be in ways other than the Holy Spirit controlling the pens of authors. After educating myself, I went back to my pastors, back to my professors, and wanted to know why didn't they tell me. And I see that's literally the title of the second lecture of your course. Why didn't anyone tell me? For someone with your background or with my background, because I also went to a Bible college, we had learned that the Bible had been given by God and that we could trust that the Bible provided his words. And then I came to realize that, in fact, there are many places where we don't know what his words were. And it made me start wondering, well, if we don't know what his words were, then we don't know if we have his words. And why would he make it so we don't know what his words are? If he went to the trouble of giving them to us, why don't we have them? <laughs> and so that was the issue there. In that lecture, what I'm dealing with is how scholars have actually known this for a very long time. From the ancient world, there are scholars, Origen and Jerome, and they know about textual variants, but they don't have a doctrine of inerrancy. <laughs> the problem is when you start with a doctrine of inerrancy, then you kind of have to pass over this little problem we've got. <laughs> and so that's a modern phenomenon. To sign up for the course, head over to tinyurl.com slash bartscribe. And if you join before November 11, you can be part of the recording and ask questions. Everyone who signs up, no matter when, gets lifetime access to all four lectures and the Q&A and other bonus material. And if you join through the link on screen and in the description, tinyurl.com slash bartscribe, you'll also be helping the mission of this channel. And I greatly appreciate it, as I appreciate your time as always, Dr. Ehrman. Okay, well, thank you. This has been fun. For more Apologia and Bart Ehrman team-ups, tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later. Thank you.